Good evening, I'm Pastor Ryan, and I want to welcome you tonight to the Four Points broadcast with Dr. Cindy Trim. We have, we have so been enjoying this new series, The DNA of Destiny. How many of you heard about The DNA of Destiny? It's blessing you, right? We're connecting to our identity in Christ, and at the same time, God is teaching us how to manage our relationships. There's so much that God is pouring out through this message, and, and we know that the revelation is going to come pouring in, and as soon as it does, we want you to tweet about it, we want you to put it on Facebook, and we want you to connect to what's going on here with this ministry by using hashtag DestinyDNA, and we're going to be talking about uh, um, destiny tonight. God is going to meet you right where you're at, wherever you are around the the world. We want you to pause and, and focus in on this message, and we want you to hit that share button so all of your friends and family can connect to this message as well. Let, let's make this message of the kingdom go viral on social media tonight. How about it? Are you guys going to be tweeting it up too, right? Well, uh, we, we don't want to waste any more time. Dr. Trim is coming to the platform right now. Would you put your hands together for the woman of God? Dr. Hallelujah. We are so excited to welcome all of you. My life group is right here in ATL, and we are joining life groups around the world, all the way in Indonesia, in the Middle East, in South Africa, in Europe, in South America, in the uh, Europe, all over the world, life groups are meeting right now, and it's just a wonderful thing to know that when we are meeting, wherever two or three are gathered together, God is in our midst. I got my two or three. Do you have your two or three? And even if you are, even if you are tuning in and it's only you, you got God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, you got your three. Let's ask God to bless the word tonight, amen? Our Father and our God, we give you praise and honor and glory. This is the day that you have made. We are rejoicing. We are glad in it. I pray today that you would think through my mind, speak through my lips. Let there be none of me, all of you. Bless our time together. Give us articulation of speech, particularly as we delve into the topic of uh, destiny. This is a word and a concept that so many people are trying to make sense out of. And as we excavate it week after week, we pray that at the end of this series, your sons and daughters will be able to make destiny decisions that will not only cause them to collide with purpose, but that purpose will uh, be attached to problems. And we together, as the body of Christ, will be able to make this world a better place. Bless the word, bless us as we deliver this word and bless the hearers of the word in Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. How many of you are having an amazing day? Well, I decree that this is the best day of your life and tomorrow is going to be even better, amen? Well, let's go directly to the word of God. Take out your notepads, your pens, your Bibles, iPads, uh, your smartphones, your dumb phones, take out whatever you got. And let's begin to really delve into the Word of God. And I am grateful to have the opportunity to do series. Oftentimes, when I travel from place to place and from country to country and ministry to ministry, um, I only have about an hour to deal with some very, very complex concepts. And destiny, out of all the concepts, is very, very complex. But we're praying that after this, you will begin to understand how simple the concept really is. And every single day, you are changing the trajectory of your destiny. Your future comes to you one day at a time. And it doesn't have to be a mystery, but you can make history when you begin to make decisions based on the prompting of the Holy Spirit, who will give you wisdom in all areas of your life and help you to make the right decisions, decisions so that your future looks nothing like your past and everything that God had in mind when he said, I know the thoughts I have to, of you, thoughts of good, not of evil, to bring you to an expected end. So let's go to the book of John, chapter 5, verses 1 to 15. John 5, verse 1, 15. Take copious notes, and then uh, later on, go back over your notes. And uh, prayerfully, from this revelation, you'll be able to extrapolate principles that will become a rhema word to you that you'll be able to apply it immediately in your life. 
and see positive change. John chapter 5, verse 1 to 15, the Bible said, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. And these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halted, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. In other words, they had no vision for their lives. You see, when, when people have no vision for their lives, they will waste your time, especially if you um, have the discipline enough to get the vision for your life, write it down, and then begin to implement it. Be careful of a person that does not have a vision of their own because nine times out of 10, they will sabotage yours. Misery loves company. And you know, vision is about how you see your life unfolding. If you cannot see it unfold, it won't unfold the way you want it to. If you cannot see it, you will not be able to seize it because your feet will never take you where your mind has never been. So you've got to have a vision for your life. You have to have a vision in 12 areas. But because we're not talking about vision, we're actually talking about destiny. We'll have an opportunity to share with you how to write a very dynamic vision that will help you to live the life of your dreams and more importantly, live the life of God's dream or the life that God had planned for you. They were blinded. They were halted. They were just stuck. And there were so many people that I meet um, and then I lose track with them and 20 years later, when I meet them again, they're talking about the same thing. They haven't done anything different. It's like their life is on stutter. You know, their next year looks like last year, and the year after that looks like this year. They're just halted. They're just stuck. They're stuck emotionally. They're stuck professionally. They're stuck relationally. They're stuck. They're just stuck spiritually. They haven't moved anywhere. There's nothing dynamic, not even about their prayer life. They're praying the same prayers for 20 years. And, um, you know, life should be dynamic, uh, you know, there's nothing boring about life. When you're stuck, it lacks luster. Nothing shines. Everything is dull. And I decree and declare, starting from today, you are going to get your brilliance back. You're going to begin to shine. And you're going to lose the dullness. And you're going to find the brilliance and excitement. You, you, you are, you're going to wonder where 24 hours a day went. You know, and it's going to be so exciting. It's going to be like uh, throwing your own birthday party every day of your life. Amen. When you wake up in the morning, the Holy Spirit will say, surprise. I got this surprising adventure for you. And then when you go to sleep, you'll be dreaming. He'll say, surprise, I'm showing up again. And when you wake up, surprise. And the most amazing things are going to happen to you. When you have a vision God is able to take the awful out of your life and put the awesome into it. You are going to live an awesome life. You're going to get awesome back. Amen. People are no longer going to say, whoa. They're going to say, wow. Amen. They were halted and withered. They were, they were withered. Things were drying up. Money was drying up. Nothing was thriving. Everything was dry, drying up. But your days of, of, of uh, things drying up, finances, your, your spiritual life, your prayer, your praise, your giving, th that season of things drying up is over. This is the season where things are about to thrive. So they were blind, halted, withered, and they were waiting. Turn to your name and ask them what you're waiting for. Because nothing happens until you make it happen. You, you could wait for the rest of your life. It ain't going to happen. You've got to make it happen. Can I just make this declaration over you? I decree and declare that this is your season of making it happen. This is your make it happen season. How are you going? How are you going to? How are you going to realize your dream? You should say, I'm going to make it happen. How are you going to realize your dream? How are you going to build your house? How are you going to buy your car? You're going to make it happen. How are you going to be wealthy? 
Why? Because God gives you power. That word power is potential. He gives you potential. And unless you find a platform for its expression, it will always just be latent power. It'll be just waiting there, waiting for an expression. You've got to make things happen. How are you going to be a best-selling author? <laughs> You're going to make it happen. How are you going to go back to school? The school is not going to call you up and say, hi, this is Harvard University, heard all about you. It would be an honor if you would apply to our school. You've got to pick up the telephone. You've got to go on the internet. You've got to write that application out. You've got to send it. Simply put, you've got to be able to. You're not waiting. The wait is over. The wait is over. The W-E-I-G-H-T and the W-A-I-T. The wait is over. They were waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in and was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity. Now that word means to lack Firmness. It means wishy-washy. Now, the scripture says that a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. So I want to float that as a balloon in a, uh, and, and pull it out of the atmosphere in a minute. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. What do you want for your life? One minute you want to be saved. The next minute you don't want to be saved. One minute you're a prayer warrior. The next minute you're not a prayer warrior. What do you want? do you want for your life? How do you want it to unfold? What do you want for your marriage? What do you want for your family? What do you want for your health? What do you want? Nobody asks us this, that question. They usually, usually tell you what they want from you. But what do you want? And a lot of times we have a revelation of what God wants for us. God gives us vision. And sometimes a vision can be overwhelming because it can be so big. And then we wonder whether or not we can accomplish it. So we start out, yes, this is what God wants me to do. And then life happens. And then eventually we give up on our dreams. We put it in the, on, on the back burner. And, and we don't, we, we, I don't know what happens, but there is something that happens to us that crushes our courage. Because it takes a lot of courage to move out of the status quo, to move out of the familiar. Because most people love the common. I love the uncommon. Most people love the ordinary. I love the extraordinary. And it's uncommon for you to want something that is extraordinary, something out of the ordinary. Because if you ever go for it, people wonder who gave you permission to think that you deserve to have that. And people ask that question, and then we ask that question of ourselves. Why should I have better? Why should I live better? And does God really want me to live that way? And if I want to live better and have more, is it materialistic? Is it being carnal? And it, it seems as if we are plagued by those questions over and over again. But we're getting ready to give you some answers in this series. And see, you should want what God wants for you. God doesn't want to, God doesn't play games with, with, with your life. It's not his will that any should perish. So that means that he wants you to live. He wants you to be healthy. He wants you to be happy. He wants you to be successful. He wants you healed. He wants you prosperous. He wants you wealthy. We, we could sit here all day and talk about God wanting you to have wealth. And why would you feel guilty when you, you begin to pray, I want to be wealthy? I want to have a lot of money. Why would you be guilty? You could do more if you had more. You could do more for the kingdom. We could fill, we can, we can, we can, we can um, house more orphans. We could feed, feed more hungry. We could heal more sick if we had more. God is going to bless you up thousand times more even as you are in other words wherever you are right now it is God's will for you to have more 
more health, more wealth, more energy, more friendships, more, more excitement, more power, more authority, more influence, more happiness, more joy. God is the God of more. In fact, he created everything to be more than what it is at the, at the day of conception. That's the power of the seed. He created a seed to be more than what it is at the point of its creation. Everything is created to be more than how it is birthed. That's why you have a baby that's growing, because it's created to be more, to be a greater human being, not to just lie there and people feed it and people lift the baby up. They're created to talk more, to eat more, to see more, to understand more. God is the God of more. Even in the animal kingdom, there is procreation. So you, you let a cat run stray for a couple of days, it's going to come back with more, more kittens. He, he lacked firmness. He, he, he was infirm. They, and, and the Bible said they were healed of in, in infirmity. But this particular man, he had been infirm for 38 years. The Bible said it was a certain man that was there amongst the clutter of the common folk. He was surrounded by uh, individuals that had no vision, didn't know where they were going. Never ask a person who doesn't know where they are for direction. <laughs> if they don't know where you are, they are, they can't help you to get to where you need to be. Even if they had a GPS, that won't help. Because the GPS calculates based on where you are. Never be afraid to bring where you are to the table when you talk to God. Where you are emotionally, he's not afraid of that. Where you are spiritually, where you are professionally, where you are relationally, where you are min ministerially, never be afraid to tell God exactly where you are. You cannot help a person that's in debt if they refuse to calculate how much they owe. And this is the problem with the average person. They want to be wealthy, but they're not going to sit down and calculate and add up all their debt. Why? They're afraid to know. Well, if you're afraid to know, there's nothing we can do to help you. There's no strategy that can, you can apply that's going to help you. You've got to be able to admit, this is where I am. This is where I am emotionally. This is where I am physically. This is where I am spiritually. You don't have to admit it to people around you, but admit it to yourself and admit it to God. When you admit it to yourself, it's called integrity. When you admit it to God, it's called credibility. It means that you're not lying to God and you're not, not lying to yourself. And God can get you from point A to point B. Number one, if you know where you are. Number two, if you know where you're going. If you don't know your destiny, your GPS can't help you. So you know where you are, but where, where do you want to be? And this is how destiny is formed. You've got to have a specific destination, and you've got to lock it in into your GPS system in order it, for it to calculate a route. And this is what decision-making is all about. It's being able to calculate your route from getting you from point A to point B. Now, knowing point B and not knowing where point A is is just like not knowing where point, point B is, but knowing where point A is. You know where you are, but you don't know where you're going. You know where you want to go, but you don't know where you are. But where you are is enough to take you where you need to go. I'm going to say it again, and I want, I, want, I want to drive it into you. Where you are is enough to get you where you need to go. In other words, you don't need to justify it. You don't need to be ashamed about it. You don't need to lie about it. It is where it is. It ain't where it ain't. Tomorrow about this time, I ain't going to be here. Why? Because I'm making a decision to be somewhere else. It is your decision, not my decision. It's a decision w uh, for, that God places in your lap. But where is that place? Where do you want to be? The Bible said that he was lacking firmness. He was wishy-washy. The scripture says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Let not that man think that he's going to get anything from God. 
And so is it possible that you're praying and praying and praying, but God is just waiting on you to confirm to him what it is that you really have made up your mind that you need, where you're going, when you're going there, how you're getting there. Do you really want to be a business owner? Are you just playing games? Do you really want to be wealthy? Do you really want to preach? Do you really want to be a doctor? Do you really want to be a lawyer? Do you really want to be a missionary? Do you really, is this what you really want for your life? Because if that's what you want, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Have you meditated? If it's, if it's occupying uh, expensive real estate, your, your brain is very expensive real estate. And your thoughts are just as expensive as it. Your thoughts are not cheap. Amen? Verse number six, when Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case. Now, we know that he had been there for 38 years. We don't know what his age was. But all we know, he had in, been in that state, that condition for 38 years. Now, watch this, verse, verse number six. When Jesus saw him lie, make note of that word. When he saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time, in that case he said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answereth him, Sir, I have no man when the waters troubled to put me into the pool. In other words, he was culturally conditioned to, to, to throw the responsibility onto someone else. He was culturally conditioned to play the blame game. I'm in this state because nobody's going to help me. It is a learn helplessness. Write that word down. Because if you learn how to be healthy, you can learn how to be empowered. If you learn how to be helpless, excuse me, you can learn how to be empowered. It's all about what you have learned. It's a paradigm. It's a paradigm. Float that a balloon. I'm coming back for it in a minute. But while I am coming, another step it down before me. For 38 years, I keep going to this pool. And every time I go, something happens. If it's not one thing, it's another. I'm trying. So what was he doing? What he was doing, he knew how to push emotional and mental and spiritual buttons in people so that people could give him money. Because there's no grown man that sits by a pool all day long and survives without someone giving him some money, someone giving him some clothes, someone giving him some food. In other words, he learned how to be a beggar. I decree and declare your days of begging are over. You are not going to ask anybody to help you. You're going to say, my help comes from the Lord. He's going to empower me, and I'm going to get out of this with the help of the Lord. You are not going to beg anybody for anything. You're not going to beg them for their money. You're not going to beg them for their time, and you're not going to beg them for their attention. The day is going to come where, you're, where they're going to want to pay you to pay attention. You're not going to beg anybody any longer. That's beneath you. God's best is not begging. God's best is that you are a benefactor. You are not going to just wait for someone to bless you. You're going to be a blessing. That's what God said. I'm going to bless you, and then in you shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. This is what God said to Abraham. As soon as I take you from the things that formed your, your paradigm, leave your kinfolk, leave your country, and leave your father's house, leave your kindred, leave your country, leave your father's house. What was he talking about? Uh, those are the elements or those are the contributing factors to a mindset or a paradigm. So that the, the very source that created the paradigm is what God is going to deliver you from. Whether it's people or friends or an educational system, somebody's getting this. You're getting this. Leave those things behind. That means if God is telling you to walk away from it, he's got new uh, uh, forms of education for you. He's got new friends for you. He's got new uh, a church for you. He's got something new that will help you to form the right kingdom paradigm. 
He said, while I'm coming, another step is in my way. These are alibis. These are excuses. He, he's talking about, look, I got these glass ceilings that I can't break. In other words, society has the haves and the have-nots, and I'm just a part of the have-nots. There's a social stratification, and I can't break through to the next level of status. People don't want me to be a part of their clique because everybody has a clique. And so I want to break through in my office. I want to break through professionally. But the boss seems like he prefers so-and-so. So we have all these excuses as to why we can't go to the next level. And most of them are self-imposed limitations. These are mental models that are bored our purpose. That the Bible says, Jesus didn't answer him. He said to him, listen, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole. So first, Jesus said to him, will thou be made whole? He didn't say, do you want to be healed? Please note, the question was, "Wilt thou be made whole? And he said, rise, take up your bed and walk. Now, this is very important. Number one, he asked him a question, what do you want? Do you want to be whole? Wholeness is all inclusive. It's not a, just about healing your body, it's the healing of the mind. Then he said, take up your bed and, 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 and rise and walk. Rise, take up your bed and walk. Now, this is interestingly, interesting because to rise means to consciously and deliberately move to a higher plane. In other words, he was saying, elevate your thinking then. Because your, physiology, your physiology follows your psychology. So your body is going to follow the flow of your mind. Are you with me? So wherever your mind goes, your energy flows. Wherever your energy flows, your life goes. So he said, elevate your thinking, think at a high level, and then while you're at it, take up your bed. The bed represents the many nights he went to sleep dreaming about walking. So put feet to your dream and get up out of here. Walk means to progress. So it's interesting because one would think that Jesus would have had pity on him and given him a crutch. But God, Jesus didn't give him a crutch. Jesus didn't give him a wheelchair. Jesus gave him a word. He didn't need a wheelchair. What he needed was a word. You don't need a wheelchair. You don't need a crutch. What you need is a word. And the word will empower you. Because when the word is spoken in the form of a mandate, it means that you already have the, the potential and the mentality to perform it. Whenever a mandate is given, it presupposes the recipient already has the potential and the mentality to perform it. If I gave you something to do, if I told you, if God told you, let me, let me put it this way. If God told you, get up and dance, it means that automatically he's going to give you the mentality to dance. He's going to give you the mindset to dance. And then he's going to activate it because you've got the potential to dance. God will never instruct you to do something that you don't have the potential to do it. So a mandate connects to potential. So if God gives you an instruction, it presupposes you can do it. Here is, here is uh, Noah. Noah, build an ark. What's an ark? Nobody in my family built ark. Nobody in my community built ark. There's no such thing as an ark in this world. It is now. Why? Because you're an ark builder. Well, I've never done it. God will never tell you to do what you don't have the potential to perform. 
And the moment he gives you an instruction, the moment he gives you a dream, the moment he gives you a vision, he begins to summon the hidden potential on the inside of you. Write that best-selling book. Oh, well, I never wrote a book, so I guess I'm going to write a bestseller now. Dev David, get up and kill Goliath. I've never killed a giant before. Nobody in my community has ever killed a giant. My family has never killed a giant. In fact, everybody in the community are afraid of giants. But David never killed a giant until he killed a giant. If you think you can, you're right. If you think you can, you're right. Either way, you're right. Elevate your thinking. This man was not lame, he was lazy. I decree your days of laziness are over. You're going to get up. You're going to stand up. You're going to speak up. And you're going to show up. You are going to show up in your own life. You are not going to be a supporting actor or actress in the unfolding of God's drama of your life. You're going to wake up every morning to decree and declare, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me. And if it's written, I'm going to be wealthy. Oh, well, this is the day that the Lord has made. I'm going to be rejoice and be glad in it because this is my day of creating wealth. Could things be the way they are because you are the way you are? And what one thing can you change that can change everything? You could change the way you think about yourself about what you're capable of doing, what you're capable of achieving, what you're capable of writing, what you're capable of owning, where you're capable of living, where you're capable of achieving. You are going to change the way you think about yourself and your capabilities. The problem with the man at the pool is he felt like he didn't have the capability to walk and it was self-imposed and plus it was the cultural conditioning. He was around people that surrounded him. And when we talk about your, your relational destiny, and that's coming down the road, we're going to talk to you about how to determine who should be in your life. Because just because people are attracted to you doesn't mean you are attracted to them. You're going to have a blueprint. Who comes in? Who leaves? Who you're going to give a going away party to? Bye, this is your going away party. Where I'm going? I don't know, but you're leaving here. That's your decision. My decision is this is my destiny. That's your de de destiny. I'm deciding that you no longer qualify. And we're going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why spiritually, and then we're going to show you scientifically what is happening when you're mixing with the wrong people and what's happening around you. When, when, when wrong people leave your life, wrong things stop happening. When bad people leave your life, bad things stop happening. What do you think about yourself? What do you think about yourself? What do you think about your capabilities? What do you think you deserve? Where do you deserve, where, where do you think you deserve to live? How much you think you deserve to be paid? What's your thoughts like? What goes on in a, in, in, in a day in your mind? Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Now, write this down. Your thoughts are pure energy. Pure energy. Did you not know that there are 100 billion neurons in an adult human brain? 100 billion? And God is going to multiply you a thousand times, even as you are. You're already a billionaire. You're already a multi-billionaire. Is what you're doing with that energy called thoughts. There are 100 billion neurons in the adult human brain. And each of you are, neuron makes 1,000 to 10,000 contacts with other neurons in the brain. The number of perm permutations and com combinations of brain activity exceeds the number of elementary particles in the universe. My God. This is, this is why the Bible says... In, in the book of Ecclesiastes, he has put eternity in your heart. He's put eternity in your heart. 
you, you, you are something to behold, but you haven't figured it out yet. And why would you allow the enemy make you become a warrior? Why use your brain for things like worrying and being revengeful? Why? Because we don't know who we are and we don't know our capabilities. We are like the paralytic man sitting for 38 years with the potential to walk. And he gave his power away to the prevailing culture. People that were around him. Self-imposed limitation, paradigms that, that would not take his life from out of stutter. 38 years, every year, every year, everything repeated, every year. It was like a bad nightmare. Think about that for a moment. Think about the pure potentiality and possibility that's sitting on your left and right. Think about the powerful person on your left and right. You are sitting next to one of the world's most powerful individuals. Turn to your neighbor and say, she's talking about me. Give me my props. I'm powerful. I'm more than, than what you see on the outside. you got pure power sitting next to you. If we add one more person to your row, to your row, I believe the whole row will blow up. It'll be too powerful. Can you imagine the type of potential that you are sitting on? And this is why the enemy doesn't want you to think. Because if you think you could think for a change, can you imagine the pure, sheer, creative power of the human imagination? Can you imagine once imagination is harnessed by vision? Vision takes imagination and it polishes it until it's laser sharp. You see, I could take a floodlight and take it into surgery and nothing will happen other than shining the light on the problem. But if I take that floodlight and if I put it in a conduit, I can create a laser that can cut open a human body. I could, put, I, I, I could do laser surgery and then wheel my patient out and there'd be no signs that they were operated on. That's how precise a light is. I could cut through metal with light. Why would you want to be a floodlight with, with your thoughts all over the place and not allow God to harness it by giving you a vision? A lot of us go to work to make money. In this season, don't just go to work, put your brain to work. And your brain has enough power in and of itself to bring to you anything you want. What are your thoughts about who you are and what you're capable of accomplishing? What are your thoughts about who you are and how it affects the highs and lows of your life, the goods in your life. Your brain has the ability to bring only good into your life. <laughs> what you think frames your reality. What you think influences your perception. What you think influences the interpretation of your reality and occurrences and experiences. And when you change how you think, you change your perception and interpretation of what is happening to you. You can be a thousandaire. You can be a millionaire. You could be a billionaire. You can be a trillionaire. You can be an immobiliere. An immobiliere means that you can't count how much the person has. You got so much stuff. It's, not, it's, not, it's in Trim's lexicon. It's a made up word. <laughs> if you think you can, you will. If you think you can, you won't. When you change your thoughts about how you are living in this world and what's coming to you and what you, uh, you deserve and what you can accomplish, when you change your mind, the course of your destiny is altered. That means you don't have to stay where you are. The prodigal son hit rock bottom. And the scripture said when he came to himself, he started thinking differently. He said to himself, how many of my father's hired servants had more to eat and I die from hunger? I will arise. Turn to your neighbor and say, tell the devil I changed my mind. 
I change my mind about how I'm living. I change my mind about what I'm receiving. I change my mind about how I'm treated. I change my mind about how I dress. I change my mind about what I wear. I change my mind about my relationship. I change my mind about my health. I change my mind about my body. I change my mind. Nothing has to remain the same. Tomorrow, about this time, everything about your life is going to be changed for the better because tonight you have changed your your thoughts every day your thoughts are, are sending out energy and like attracts like like attracts like. So it goes out. We call it going out in the, uh, 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 in, into uh, the universe. But I don't believe it's being sent out into the universe and the universe is doing anything. I believe it's the providence of God. But you're sending it out on a supernatural highway. Like, like a, a, a train, a railroad track. So it leaves you and then it comes back on the same track. And it comes back not as a thought, but it comes back as an experience, a meeting, an encounter, a relationship. It comes back as a condition. You send it out, it's going to come back. The Bible said, sow to the wind, reap a whirlwind. And these are your thoughts. And thoughts are very powerful. I was going to wait to give you this revelation. But you remember Be Me Up, up Scott from Star Trek? And you remember they would go from one galaxy to another and it was being propelled? Well, it was being propelled by an energy. Now, this energy is using what is called um, antimatter. So they need matter and antimatter. Now, this is all scientific quantum physics, and I'll make it simple for you. So when you get matter and it converges with antimatter, it annihilates, and what is left is energy. So you see when they say, be me up, Scotty, and then it disappears and there's nothing there. So what they're doing is they cause, cause matter and antimatter to collide. It annihilates, and what is left is energy. And then they show up somewhere else. So that's, that's the, the theory behind that. It's um, quantum physics. When matter converges with antimatter, then energy remains. Now, imagine a person who has nothing but negativity going on with their life. All they got is debt, disease, confusion, arguments. Every time you see them, they got a problem. Imagine having that type of energy around you. Because you're pure energy. And you're colliding with these folk every single day. Who's going to allow them in their life? If you had somebody that had a house and a storm hit it and their house uh, collapsed. And, 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 you know, the neighbors helped them. And then the next storm, right? They, 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 it, 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 their house gets blown away. And then the next storm, the house gets blown away. Then they stay with you. And the house gets blown away. Would you take them to the next house? <laughs> do, you, do you understand what I just said? You are pure energy. You, you may not see it. We call it, some people call it aura. You know, you, you meet a person and you just say, I felt strange around them, something strange. Have you ever met a person and they just made you feel funny? It's that energy field that is around them. Biblically, we call it faith or fear. Are you with me? But there's an energy field around you and it causes things to be attracted to you. Could things be the way they are because you are the way you are? You need people that have capacity to carry you to your next. You need people around you that have been where you're trying to go. Most of you have people around you that has never done what you're trying to do, never been where you're trying to go. Listen to me carefully, especially you, that God has blessed as businessmen, businesswomen, and you're doing pretty good. And none of your friends have a business. And then you, you, you wonder why. I don't know why. You know, I made all this money last year in the business, and I don't have nothing this year. Check your family. Check your Uncle Baba. Check your Auntie Lucy. 
Check your friends. Who's around you? What energy are they bringing to the table? Here is this man, his paralytic. He's around people that have no vision. What kind of energy is that? A blind, vi blind energy. So now he can't see. I can't see I'm going to pay these bills. I can't see how God is going to do this. You lost your ability to see. And they're halted, they're stuck. So imagine people, all the, everybody around him is, is, is impotent. And it's an issue of what? Mind over matter. We're going to talk about destiny, and we're going to keep digging. Because you've got to deal with your relationships. Thoughts are real, physical things that occupy mental real estate. Moment by moment, every day, you are changing the structure of your brain through your thinking. This is what Carolyn Leaf said, switch on your brain, the key to peak happiness and thinking and health. She also says our choices, the natural consequence of thoughts and imagination, get under the skin of our DNA and can turn certain genes on and off, changing the structure of the neurons in our brains so our thoughts, imagination, and choices can change the structure and function of our brains on every level. This is why when you read scripture, and the scripture says repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They're not talking about you uh, confessing your sin. If he wanted you to confess your sin, he would have said confess. He said repent. Repent means change the top of you. Point to the top of you. Point to the top of you. No, that's your brain. The top of you is not your brain. The top of you is your mind. Your spirit is no longer just mind over matter. It's spirit over matter. And if it's mind over matter, guess what's going to happen? It means that your spirit, the spirit realm, can control the natural realm to change the very uh, nature of your brain, to change the structure of your brain. And it can happen, and it happens by choices. Every day you make a decision, something is being altered, even if it's your brain. Even if you don't see it in your immediate environment, even if you don't see it as an immediate manifestation, something is changing and something is, offer, uh, is being altered. That's why Paul said, let this mind be in you, that which was also in Christ Jesus. And he said, I beg you, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are praiseworthy, if there be any virtue. He said, I want you to think on these things. Why? Because you you have the ability to change the very landscape of your brain. You're smarter than you even let on, to, uh, let on to. You're a thinking machine. You're a wealth-creating machine. You're a money-making machine. And it's all in your brain. This is how God has wired you to be. But if you don't have enough, don't, don't blame it on your employer. Blame it on your own thoughts. You've got to be able to alter your thinking. Scientists believe that we utilize less than 10% of our capacity of brain power. So if you are able to put 10% with the remaining 90% potentiality, this would mean you would totally maximize your potential. But the average individual wastes their brain power on worrying and begging rather than creating what they want. One of the things that Albert Einstein said, what a betrayal of man's dignity. He uses the highest, his highest gift, his mind, only 10%, and his emotions and instincts, 90%. You don't have to use your instinct because that's what animals do. Animals are driven by instinct and urges, but you've got a brain. It's impossible for an animal to be fake. Why? because he doesn't have an alternative self to be. He doesn't have the ability to imagine and create. He can only move by urges. But you can be anything you want to be because you've got nothing but brain power. You are a creative machine. You are an innovative machine. 
Every single day you are crafting your future and you're making a myriad of, of decisions. Why don't you become deliberate and conscious with the use of your brain? Rather than just letting it happen, why don't you use your brain? Thank you, Jesus. Let me go back to the text. Are you getting any, anything out of this? When God gives you a vision and you say to people, oh, I'm going to own a million, uh, 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 I'm going to live in a, uh, a mansion. They're going to say, how are you going to do that? You don't make that much money. You're going to say, let me just think for a moment. Because you could think your way into anything. You could think your way out of anything. Rather than using excuses, rather than seeing things as they are, why don't you see things as they could be? What do you want? Jesus had a conversation and said to him, will thou be made whole? He said, look, I don't have nobody to help me. And while I'm coming, there's always someone getting in my way. Jesus asked him, will thou be made whole? He continued, what do you want? What do you want? What do you want? And he kept giving excuses. Well, I tried 38 years. You can imagine what it's like living here. Nobody gets out of this place. I try to get people to help me. And you've been telling the same story. Every, every new person that comes into your life, you repeat that story. You tell the same story, what your daddy didn't do, what your mama didn't do, you know, who hurt you, you know, who dropped you when you were two months old. You tell the same story. And the reason why I can't think, because I was dropped when I was two months old. And if they hadn't dropped me, then I would have been able to think better. You're always, <laughs> you got these wonderful stories. And we call them alibis. And Jesus didn't listen to any of his alibis. He spoke directly to potential. Today, I'm speaking directly to your potential. We all have a story, but we have an opportunity to change our childhood scripts and then acquire adult strategies. And that's what God wants you to have, adult strategies. He gave him a, a, alibis, and then finally, he must have said, well, this ain't working. He ain't giving me no money. He ain't taking me to Kentucky Fried Chicken to buy me. So let me tell the man, yes. And then, like I said, he didn't get a wheelchair. He got a word. He got a word. Take up your bed. Take up your own bed. You are not responsible for taking up everybody's bed around you. You take up yours, and then you tell your Uncle Baba, I took up mine. I'm going to give you an opportunity to take up yours. <laughs> when I read this story, the word that popped out is so much in here. When Jesus saw him lie. Let me just end with a discussion on lying. Lying is not only reclining horizontally but it's also the misrepresentation of the truth. The truth about who you are and what you have the capability and capacity to achieve, to become, to do, and to acquire. You lie. You know you deserve better and you could do more, but somehow you've been lulled into not maximizing your potential, maximizing your day, maximizing your gifts, maximizing your relationships. The thing that is said about this story is he not only lied about who he was and what he was capable of doing, he not only misrepresented the truth. And there were so many believers that are misrepresenting the truth about who they are. This is what God said. You are the head and not the tail. You are first and not last. You are above only and not beneath. He said, I will bless the work of your hand and you shall not borrow, but you shall land to many nations. He said, I will set you on high above every nation. This is what God said about you. 
That means, you know, when I think about people, I know some people who are nurses, and there's nothing wrong being a nurse, but they have the potential to be a surgeon, but they stopped. I know some people that work at, as entry-level clerks in law firms, and they have the potential to be a partner in that law firm. I know some people that make thousands of dollars in a year, but they have the potential to make millions. They are misrepresenting who they are by accepting mediocre, mediocrity as a way of life. This is good enough. It is not good enough. Lying compromises the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system, the parasympathetic nervous system. It taxes the brain. It causes stress-related illnesses and harms the body. And what the, what, what the doctors call stress-related illnesses, they call it fibromyalgia. That's another name for I don't know what's wrong with you. Because they can't find nothing wrong with you. It's mind over matter. Could it be that this man had self-defeating thoughts about his own ability to break away from cultural captivities and thus his hopelessness caused his helplessness and infirmity? Could it be? Could it be his muscles atrophied as he looked for alibis for why he was not doing, being, succeeding, prospering. He lived amongst people of the lie that perpetuated, pointed out rather than pointing in. They talked about what people didn't or didn't do for them. They talked about what society doesn't do for them. They talk about what government doesn't do for them, but they never do for themselves. They are people of the lie. David Hawkins did some research on this. He said, the more you lie, the weaker your psychological and spiritual and neurological and physical muscles become because a lion affects your autonomic nervous system. Remember the ice bucket challenge where people were throwing ice? What they would do, it was about the ANS, the autonomic nervous system. In other words, your ANS or visual nervous system or involuntary nervous system is a part of the peripheral nervous system that acts as a control system functioning largely below the level of your consciousness and controls your visual functions. The ANS is responsible for heart rate, digestion, respiratory rate, salvation, perspiration, palpitation, um, uh, urination, any kind of arousal. It's important that you understand what is going on every time you misrepresent the truth about what you are, who you are, and what you're capable of doing. It is affecting every part of you. It's affecting your brain. It's affecting your heart. When they, when they connect people to a lie detector, they're connecting that, that device to the ANS because the ANS does not lie. Are you a boy or a girl? The answer is either yes or no. Did you kill so-and-so? Were you at so-and-so? And your autonomic nervous system is the one that signals whether they're lying or not because it's something that you cannot control. This man was weakening his muscles. Every day he began, every day he said, I can't walk, I can't work. Listen to me carefully. He had learned helplessness. Why? Because it was easier for him to beg than it was for him getting a job. So he learned for 38 years how to manipulate people, how to manipulate their mind, how to manipulate their psychology. Because if he didn't beg, he wouldn't live. And he was a man that had the uh, potential to be a business owner. He had the potential to be an actuarial scientist. Why? Because every beggar knows after 10 people, one of those 10 is going to give me some money. I just don't know who, which one of the 10. So they beg 10 people. Are you with me? 
Why use your skill to be a beggar? It means that he has to be a logistician. He has to know exactly where the crowd will walk in order to be a beggar. Why would he use his ability to be a logistician, to be a psychiatrist, to be a psychologist? Why? Because he had to read people. He knew the ones that were going to kick him and the ones that would be pitiful to him. And he knew who to ask and who not to ask. All of that potential on the inside side of him and he just sat there waiting and he was slapping God in the face. You've got to understand just as long as you stay as you are, keep blaming the devil, keep blaming your mother, keep blaming your father, keep blaming your boss, keep blaming the economy. When you've got the potential to break away from the clutter of the common, you've got the potential to be more powerful than what you are, but you are allow people to tell you how far to go and to tell you what you're not and to tell you what you can do and then you repeat it over and over long enough until you believe that these are your thoughts and these are your ideas. I can't do this because I'm a foreigner. I can't do this because nobody knows me. I can't do that. I can't be this. My boss don't like me. This person don't like me. What does the price of tea have to do with people that don't like you? They don't even know you. They can't like like something they don't know. They can have an opinion, but they, they you know, what business of, you, of, of yours is that? A lot of times we don't understand that we have lived in a state for so long that is affecting everything about you. I believe that most of the health maladies that we are seeing, that we are trying to cure with pharmaceuticals can be cured with a good dose of truth. A good dose of truth about who we are. We are not individuals living as flawed being because we have this dumb saying, oh, I'm just human. As if being human is somehow a tantamount to being flawed. But when God created you, he didn't create you as a monkey. He created you as a human being. He said, I'm creating them after my image, after their likeness. And he called us a human being. He called us a sentient being. That means the more human you are, the more God-like you are. And many of us get mixed up with our fallen nature and our human nature. Maybe your fallen nature is sin, but your human nature is God-like. Your human nature is holy. You are not flawed, but but you are fabulous. You are not only fabulous, you are incredible. You are not only incredible, you are intelligent. You are a powerful being. God made you to live better, to do better. He made you to be, hallelujah, a reflection of everything that he is. He said, let your light so shine, hallelujah, that man may see your good work, hallelujah, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. As a as long as you stay connected to the Babylonian system, you will always be a beggar. Hallelujah, the Babylonian system perpetuates the lie. It seduces humanity to attempt, hallelujah, the, to, to attempt to meet their needs without God. Hallelujah, it's a strange thing when we are reminded that it was the Babylonian system that educated you. We are educated in it. We are called culturalized in it. We are socialized in it. We build our relationship within it. We work in it. It is all around you. The Babylonian system is there. When you wake up, when you go to work, when you go to worship, every day you got to choose whether or not you're going to be seduced by it or whether you're going to resist it. The Babylonian system produce the current paradigms that undermine what it really means to be human and it's a revelation that each of us need hallelujah that human beings in its purest sense we are not marred but we are marvelous we are created in the image and the likeness of God and each time we buy into the lie we mis misrepresent God hallelujah by failing to be godly the consequences of life Hallelujah is not just about how it is affecting you, but how it is affecting the world. Lying affects the unconscious mind of humanity, and everybody knows unconsciously when they're being lied to, and everybody 
everybody lies. Lying brings us into the realm of atrophy. Truth recalibrates anything that has been atrophied by a lie. This is why the Bible said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. Every one of our thoughts has an effect not only on ourselves, but a rippling effect on the world. A small white lie has a greater impact on society than we could ever imagine. It affects, ha has serious consequences. Lying starts with a motive and an intention. How does lying start? When people lie, lying is a demonic strategy used to cover up something, used to hide something, used to get something, used to avoid something. When Jesus saw him lie, lying is motivated by fear, fear of the consequences of telling the truth. Lying. Lying is intended to cover something up. Lying. When Jesus saw him lie, lying hurts others. It hurts others because of projection, because of exaggeration, because of a violating commandment, trying to cover up ourselves. Hallelujah. Affects us on every level. Lying stems from cultural and social conditioning where you've been trained that if you tell the truth, you are going to have to suffer the consequences and many of us don't want to suffer the consequences because we've seen when someone tells the truth the consequences usually are not good when you tell the truth about yourself people usually re reject you and rejection is painful and so we start lying about ourselves oh I'm not that bright I'm not that intelligent I can't really preach I'm not that pretty I'm not that gorgeous oh this ugly thing you look good. Oh, no, I don't. This is 10 years old. We keep lying. Lying impacts us corporately. It impacts us with business deal. Lying impacts financially. It impacts us emotionally. Have you ever been lied to a person that you trust? And when you find out that they lied to you, the pain of being deceived and you never trust them again. It, it hurts you emotionally. Lying impacts us culturally. It impacts us nationally. It impacts us corporately. It impacts government. It impacts the church. It impacts relationship. Lying. Lying causes you to live in the realm of falsehood. Living in the realm of falsehood creates a significant amount of confusion in your mind. And as long as you are confused, you can never think straight. When you have confusion, the thing that you have to do to to eliminate confusion is to make a decision. You're confused because you know you have to make a decision. But in making a decision, you don't make it because you're afraid of the fallout. Somebody is not going to like you. Someone's going to leave you. Someone's going to misunderstand you. So you just live a lie. Hallelujah. Lying causes mental conflict. Lying causes emotional anguish. Lying is a misuse of your creative power. Lying is a misuse of your innovative power. Lying is a misuse of your ability. Unfortunately, many people don't realize that they are living a lie because they've never been shown the truth about who they really are and the incredible potential that lies within. People around you always talks about what you don't have, but you can't see what I have. People talk about what you can't do, but you can't compliment me about what I can do. If you have on a black suit, and there's one piece of lint, the suit could be a designer suit, but they'll always say, you got this white lint on you, but you can't compliment me for my designer suit. That means what you have to do is to believe what God is saying about you and encourage yourself. God is telling me to tell you that you are good enough, you are pretty enough, you are tall enough, you are educated enough, Enough. You have enough money, enough resources, enough connection to move from where you are. Today, I decree you will not lie another day in your life.
when Jesus saw him lie, when he misrepresented who he was, when he allowed the culture to put, on a, put a cap on his progress, on his potential, when he allowed people to take his personal power, I'm going to tell you something. When you misrepresent who you are, you cheat the world. The world is waiting for you. You lie when you fail to exercise your potential. It's misrepresenting the truth. You lie when you fail to discipline yourself. You lie when you fail to acquire life skills. Instead, you continue on with your childhood scripts. You undermine your true worth, your true value, by failing to become all that God has wired you to become. And every time you fail to rise up and take your right, rightful place in this world and accept the lies of the enemy and accept the lies of the Babylonian system concerning your future, something in you atrophies and dies. It might be your dream. It might be an opportunity, but something in you dies. Every time you believe the lies the enemy tells you directly or indirectly, like you'll never make it, and it doesn't make sense trying. You're only going to fail. It's always going to be this way. Nobody is here for you. Every time you believe that lie, something in you atrophies and dies. It's like killing your potential at point blank, blank range. Bam. Every time you misrepresent who you are. And so today, when we talk about the DNA of destiny, it starts with truth. The truth about who you are and what you're worth. And from today on, you are not going to use any more excuses and no more alibis. This man said, every time I try, some obstacle is thrown in my way. He had become discouraged and despondent to the point of giving up and thus relegated to living in a subsistence state. To, today, I want to declare something over your life. God is delivering you from discouragement. This man lived amongst a culture of common characterized by cultural conditioning. He became a product of his environment. And then he was relegated to live amongst the demographics characterized by begging. He had lost his inner drive. Misery loves company. Water seeks its own level. And so he was connected to people who were equally paralyzed. Nobody could help him because they were going nowhere. They were paralyzed physically. They were paralyzed emotionally. They were paralyzed financially. Yet others that were professional, they weren't living amongst them. The others that were succeeding, they were living amongst them. That means that if you are going to succeed in life, if you're going to progress beyond where you are, number one, you got to make a decision. Number two, you got to be bold. And number three, you got to be unapologetic. This does not work for me any longer. It means that you've got to get your ability to dream again. Take up your bed. The bed was a metaphor for his dreams. And when you are able to dream again, you're able to break cycles, you're able to build a new life, you're able to be, begin again. Only those who see the invisible do the impossible. He couldn't see himself. He couldn't see himself ever walking, ever having a job. So he lived a subsistence, sub been below system life, below life. They were satisfied with living on the fringes of society. They were satisfied with working in the worst jobs in their industry. I decree you are no longer going to work in the fringes of society. Live on the fringes of society, and you are no longer going to be taking the worst jobs in your industry. You are going to have the best jobs. You deserve it. God gets ready to change your life. He will introduce a new person into it. Whenever the devil gets ready, 
to sabotage your life, he will introduce a new person in it. Your relationships determine your destiny. The paralytic was introduced to a new relationship, and he had a purpose-driven encounter. The Bible said the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. What did we lose? Our ability to live like human beings. In conclusion, could it be that his limited belief in his abilities limit his, his capacity? Could it be that giving away his personal power to the environment and the prevailing culture left him powerless? Could it be that his poor image of himself caused him to sink into the abyss of non-productivity, intellectual atrophy, and poverty? Could things be the way they are because you are the way you are? And what one thing can you change that can change every day? You can change your mind about how you see yourself in this world, how you see yourself succeeding, how you see yourself growing, how you see yourself prospering, how you see yourself contributing. You could change your mind anytime you get ready. Why? Because thinking is free. How do you think about yourself? What do you think that you deserve? Where do you think you should live? What do you think you should drive? Who do you think you should marry? And if you're married, uh, it's kind of late, but When you walk out of here, remind yourself, I'm created for so much more. I'm created for greatness. God is giving me power to create, to expand, to increase. I am a creative being. I am God's agent. Today, I'm not going to try any longer. I'm going to trust and I'm going to do. I believe in myself. So I'm going to fight for my dreams. I'm going to fight for my destiny. I'm going to stand up, speak up, and I'm never going to apologize for wanting better. The DNA of destiny starts in your mind. And a lot of us have been socialized and we've acquired paradigms that brought us into this state. Our thoughts create an invisible energy field around us which becomes a magnetic force like attracts like. And when you change the way, way you think about yourself, change how you feel about yourself and what you're worth, things will begin to change. I deserve better. So you'll live better. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, our God, we give you praise and honor. We thank you from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Even as we begin to talk about and continue on our conversation about the DNA of destiny. When we walk out of here, when we turn off our lights, when we go to bed, when we park our car, we've got a lot to think about. The Babylonian system is filled with people of the lie. The devil is the father of lies. But Jesus, you are the truth. The truth sets us free. It liberates us. People are talking about today, find your truth, but that's small t. We're not trying to find our truth. We're trying to find the truth, capital T. It's not a process, but a person. It's not a principle, but a person. It's not a virtue, but a person. It is you, Jesus. And we thank you now that as we look at ourselves, we can always see the things that are wrong, the mistakes that we made, because we just did not know who we were. We didn't know our worth. We didn't know our identity. And most of us didn't even know that we could give our, ourselves a gift of decision-making. 
So we're taking our lives out of neutral. We're shifting it into gear. And we pray for wisdom. We pray for insight. Father, we've been sleeping too long. 38 years is a long time, just waiting and waiting. But now we decree and declare our proverbial 38 years are over. And tonight we're going to take up our beds and we're going to progress. We're walking into new relationships. We're walking in the spirit. We are walking in truth and we are walking with you. Bless us, God, as our destinies are altered moment by moment and day by day. Now unto him who is able to do the exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think. It's according to the power that works in us. Amen. 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 Yes, God, the DNA of destiny. You know, the common thread throughout this whole series is who are you connected to? Right? Because when a new and influential person comes into your life, your season immediately shifts. And so we want to speak to you in this room, but all of you that are watching online right now, we want to be connected to you. Whatever's going on in your life negatively can shift with an effectual and new relationship. We want to be that new relationship in your life. We want to pray for you. We have prayer partners standing by right now. And we also want to connect with you as a partner. Would you sow a seed into Cindy Trim Ministries and connect to us and the empowering work that we're doing around the world? I'm telling you, testimonies are rolling in of, of healed bodies, healed minds, uh, finances turning around, marriages being restored, and they're coming in from all over the world. I'm telling you, this message is going out with power, and we want to expand this vision. We want to be able to reach more people. We want to be able to put this footage into the hands of, of studios in Africa, in Europe, and be able to transmit this message even further than we're doing it right now. We want to expand. Will you walk with us on this journey of expansion? Just hit that give button right now. If you're on Facebook, it's it's in the description above. And we also want to see you in person. L let's continue this relationship with a face-to-face -face encounter. We want to invite you to end your year strong empowerment summit. This year, 2018, it's going to be December 7th and 8th. We have an amazing lineup of speakers. Dr. Bill Winston, Bishop Tomlinson, Dr. Cindy Trim is our host. It's going to be incredible. We have Pastor Stephen and Lori Ward leading worship, and we also have special guest Todd Delaney. How many of you love Todd Delaney, your great name? He's going to be there. You want to register right now. And guess what? There's limited time to get an early bird special. So go ahead and hit that button right now. Early bird is $39. After that, the price is going to increase on uh, uh, Janu uh, June the 1st. So register now so you can get your seat at one of the most profound events in all of 2018. We're going to give you the prophetic momentum to push you in to the new year with tools, strategies. It's going to be incredible. You don't want to miss it. We want to thank you for joining us, and we encourage you to come back every first and third Thursday where it's live, it's prophetic, and it's all God. We'll see you then.